When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save 50%. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who just tattooed the initials of Kim Kardashian's children right on his bare body. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the very stylish and topical Captain. Yeah, they call me Captain Pete. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are excited to be featuring Purple Haze by the wonderful people over at Abita Brewing. Purple Haze is a song by the late, great Jimi Hendrix, of course, but it's also a fine, delicious beer, perfect for warm weather. This is an American-style wheat beer brewed with real raspberries added after filtration. The berries add a fruity aroma, slightly sweet taste, and of course, the Purple Haze. And in my humble garage opinion, Abita is one of the most energy efficient and environmentally friendly breweries in this great country. And for that, I thank you. And let's do some thank yous and a toast to our good garage friends. First up, a big cheers to Ashley Hunt and Parts Unknown. Thank you to Ashley who sent us this delicious six pack. And a big shout out to Brittany in Millington, Tennessee. Next up, we have a cheers to Audrey and Nesbitt, Mississippi. And a big we like to chip to Gina in Muncie, Indiana. Next up, we have Acton in Alameda, California. And last but certainly not least, we have Stacy and McCalla, Alabama. Those folks filled up this beautiful garage fridge this week. And so we say please and thank you. Yeah, B-W-E-R-U-N, Beer Run. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast. If you're listening and you're not subscribed, what are you doing with your life? Get your life together. Hit that subscribe button and I'll thank you for it. There you go. Thank you. And that's enough of the business. All right, everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. I just want to know where he is, if he's safe or not, because that's the hardest thing, right? (laughs) Is not knowing. Deanna McKinney hasn't heard from her son for two weeks. There's a flyer on the door of her West Lebanon apartment, like dozens of others posted in towns along the New Hampshire and Vermont border, hoping to find 19-year-old Austin Colson. I can't sleep or eat or anything because I'm so worried because I don't know. It's just killing me inside. Police say on January 11th, Colson left an apartment he shared with his girlfriend in Royalton, Vermont. Authorities say Colson may have gone to collect scrap metal. A partially filled trailer it's believed he was using was found in nearby Sharon. To date, uh, we uh, have had no uh, sightings or contacts with him. Obviously, his family is very, very concerned. 
Uh, this is, uh, is described to us as very unlike him. Captain Sinclair says Colson's cell phone has been turned off since 11 o'clock on the day he disappeared. And while they don't suspect foul play at this point, they have received no credible leads to his whereabouts. His mother hopes someone can help the family get answers. It kills me inside because I know my son, he wouldn't just get up and disappear with no evidence of anything. It's like he just vanished. It's hard for me not knowing what happened or where he is, if he's safe or if he's not. A couple of months ago, I received the following email. Hi, Nick. I've listened to you guys for a few years now. I live in a small area in Vermont that is close to New Hampshire. And we had a horrendous murder that happened a few years ago. And still to this day, there has been no conviction. This needs attention brought back to it. This is a very small town with not a whole lot going on. Trisha Haynes was the last murder that was left by the wayside. And I don't want that to happen again. This young man was murdered and found in the wall of a barn. I would really like this case brought to light. The victim was a young man. And the perpetrator is a nasty and continued offender of all kinds of crimes. Who continues to get away with this murder. And it sickens so many of us. I would love for the two of you to tell this story, please might help bring the process of a conviction back. And that is what led us to this week's true crime story. It's a case where we have a young man trying to better his life. Sure, he makes mistakes, and sure, he might take some shortcuts. But he is still growing and still learning. Learning to make it out on his own, one way or another. He's a man in some ways, and in other ways, he's still just a kid. So in those years, sure, mistakes can happen all of the time. But 99% of the time, those mistakes are not fatal. But in this case, he trusted someone he should not have. And then, he paid for it with his life. We are here to tell you that someone our victim knew is responsible for his murder. Yet four years later, that man continues to evade a conviction. Will he ever face murder charges? And will we ever find justice for this young man? This is True Crime Garage, and this is the case of Austin Colson. On Thursday, January 11, 2018, Katie Grizoffi said goodbye to her 19-year-old boyfriend, Austin Colson, when he left their apartment located at 224 Rainbow Street in South Royalton, Vermont. This was around 5 in the morning. Previously, Austin had asked to borrow his father's trailer so he could pick up some loads of scrap metal and get them to a dealer. So that was the plan for the day pick up and haul some loads of scrap metal, get paid, and return the trailer as soon as possible. Austin will have some help with the labor as well. A buddy of his named Rich Whitcomb will be working with him. So the two, Austin and Rich, were going to go pick up the trailer that morning and return it at the end of the day. Katie, his girlfriend, was texting Austin throughout the day, but at some point Austin stopped replying to her text. Then later, Katie's text to Austin started not going through at all. Katie wasn't too worried because in Vermont, there are lots of dead cell service areas. Sometimes you have to drive up a mountain to get some service and calls can get dropped with no warning. So she really didn't start to worry until much later. Yeah. And the type of work that Austin is doing, there's no set in time. So she's not going to get worried because his end time of work could vary every single day. 
Now, he's supposed to pick up this trailer from his father's house. This is actually a very typical situation. Austin would pick up the trailer from his father's house, take the scrap metal, get money for the scrap metal, and then return the trailer. At some point in the day, before 2 o'clock, around, I'm guessing, 1.45 or so, is when Austin's father sees that his trailer's gone, but again, no big deal because he'll bring it back later that day. Yeah, no big deal because the trailer is supposed to be gone. Right. Arrangements were already made. So his father is, his name is Dana, and it's, yes, right around 1.45 p.m. that he notices that, one, his trailer is gone, as Austin said it would be, but also he notices that Austin's vehicle was parked there at his property. So Dana knew that Austin and whoever was helping him that day would have hooked the trailer up to someone else's vehicle. Now, that night, when Dana gets back home the second time, and the trailer was still gone, and Austin's car is still there, right where his son had left it early that morning, this seems like something that he might be concerned about, but Austin's father, Dana, would actually say that at first he wasn't concerned. He still wasn't concerned. He assumed that they were just running late or had run into some type of unpredictable delay, and that eventually the trailer would be returned that night or maybe even the following morning. But Katie was a completely different story. She was really starting to worry about Austin because Austin wasn't answering his text, and by now it was late. And as we said, at some point, she believed the texts weren't even going through to him, and he's still not responding at a later time. So she starts to drive around looking for Austin. She continues to call him and text him, but there's no response from her boyfriend. His phone was off, as far as she knew. By 4 a.m., so this would be nearly 24 hours since she last seen Austin, she, at this point, is hysterical. And not knowing what else to do, she drove over to her mother's house. Her name is Lori. And the two of them together started making phone calls. Katie texted Deanna. This is Austin's mom who lived in New Hampshire, praying that she would have heard from her son, but she hadn't. Deanna called her ex-husband, Dana, waking him up. And same story there as well, Captain. No, he hadn't seen or heard from Austin as well. Yes, his car was still at his house. And now is when we all start to believe that something was terribly wrong. Austin's mother is going to notify the police that he is missing. Yes, she starts by calling the New Hampshire State Police. Remember, she lives in New Hampshire. Austin lives in Vermont. So she's told to call the police in Vermont where Austin lived and had vanished from. She does so, and the police took down a report. Initial media reports say only that foul play was not suspected, but police were concerned for Austin's welfare. But Deanna emphasized that Austin had never before left and remained out of touch for more than a day with his family and especially with his girlfriend. They were extremely close. So she was concerned. And later she admitted on a segment of Channel 5 News that Austin's disappearance might have something to do with drugs. Now, we have his father, Dana, that said in an interview that the family went over to this guy's home. Who is this guy? Well, we've heard this name before already. Richard Whitcomb's house. They wanted to see if they could find Austin. Remember, it was no mystery who Austin was working with on the day that he did not come home. So we have Austin, who's missing, went working with Richard Whitcomb. We also have this trailer that is still missing. It's never been returned to Austin's father at this point. Whitcomb was the man with whom Austin told his family he would be scrapping with on the day that he went missing. Yeah, Richard was somebody that would help him with different jobs. But it's not out of the realm of possibility that you wake up, hey, we're going scrapping today, and Richard says, hey, I can't make it. Well, and Austin worked for himself and at times would work with different people. He didn't work with Richard Whitcomb daily. This was specific right. to that day's task. Now, keep in mind, though, another key factor here is not only has he worked with Richard in the past and told people that he would be working with Richard on that day, Dana quickly points out that 
he knew that Richard's vehicle was capable of towing his trailer. Austin's car was not capable of pulling the trailer. And Wickham was someone Austin worked with and hung out with regularly, according to Katie, his girlfriend. That's a great point that you bring up, and I think that's very important for people to understand. Austin's vehicle could not tow this trailer. Austin had to be driving somebody else's car or somebody had to be driving a vehicle that was capable of moving this trailer because we know the trailer's not there. Right. And when they go, when the family goes to speak with Richard Whitcomb, he says, well, no. In fact, I hadn't seen Austin that Thursday after all. I know he told you that we were going to be working together, but I didn't see him one. And two, I have no idea who had towed the trailer. But he says he himself was about 100 miles away in Manchester, New Hampshire on that same day. So not only did he not help Austin, he was busy and he was out of town doing other things for about the entirety of the day. Right. An alert on the Vermont State Police Facebook page said that Austin Colson was missing and he was five foot eight inches tall, 135 pounds with brown hair and brown eyes said that he was last seen wearing blue jeans, boots, and a hooded camo jacket with a white ball cap with black lettering with the words a and C painting on it. After that visit from the family, rich Whitcomb's wife, Sarah started posting on the state police Facebook page about Austin's disappearance saying she was hoping he would be found safe and soon. This makes this case a little more difficult because Austin working for himself, you don't have this definitive list of people that Austin could have been working with. But let's dive into his background so we know a little bit more about who Austin is. Austin Colson was a Vermont native born to mom Deanna and dad Dana, who were divorced. Dana lived just a few miles away, and Deanna lived in nearby New Hampshire. Austin also had an older brother and a younger sister. He went to Hartford High School where he played basketball, soccer, and baseball, but he never graduated. In the winter of 2018, he was trying to get his life on track. And at this point, he's actually running his own and at this point, he's actually running his own painting business. That's the A and C painting that he started in 2017. Things had gone well initially, but business took a downturn in the wintertime. So Austin and Katie had to take on odd jobs to make ends meet. Hauling scrap metal was one of the jobs that he regularly took on. Austin also made homemade soaps and candles that he sold at farmer's markets and even in local retail stores. And he was working to get his GED in 2018 before he went missing. Austin and his girlfriend, Katie, as we said, were very close. Deanna later said of their relationship, quote, he had a good girlfriend and they both loved each other to death and would do anything for each other, end quote. While Austin was missing, Katie told Dateline, I just want him home. I love him more than anything. Now, no one in Austin's family or Katie herself believed that Austin had just gone away on his own. Again, we... He was very close with his family, very close with his girlfriend, and specifically, he was very close with his younger sister and his father. The relationship that he had with his girlfriend to everyone said that it was rock solid. His family truly felt and believed and and shouted this from the mountaintops that his leaving, Austin leaving, was really just simply out of the question. Well, let's look at some of the evidence. He, He takes no belongings with him. He doesn't even have his vehicle, and he then takes a trailer. It, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Well, and if Rich Whitcomb did not go with him that day, we know somebody went with him that day because, as you pointed out, his vehicle can't tow the trailer. Right. So we need to fill in that blank real quickly. Was Rich actually with him that day, or did somebody else take Rich's place? And now we need to figure out who that person is. Almost a week after Austin vanished, Katie and her mom, Lori, they're together. They end up finding the missing trailer 
This on one of the back roads. This was a downer road in Sharon, Vermont, about 10 miles from Dana's home. We have Dana who says, when I was notified, I dropped what I was doing and drove there as fast as I could get down there. He says when he got there to the trailer, all of the detectives were already on the scene. The trailer was parked on the side of the road perpendicular to the road. The trailer was still partially loaded with some of the scrap metal pieces that they were to be hauling that day. There was a light dusting of snow on the trailer. So, according to everybody that was there that day, they agreed that this meant that the trailer had been sitting there for a couple of days. So, missing trailer found. However, there's still no sign of Austin. So, they find the trailer, but they don't find a vehicle with the trailer and again, we, we need a vehicle to be pulling this trailer. The area in which they find the truck, not only is there light dusting of snow, I'm guessing it's pretty cold this time of year. What I see here, Captain, is a situation where it's fortunate that the police are taking this young man's disappearance seriously, right? There's been some debate about that. However, what we do know is we have the father who owns the trailer mm -hmm. saying, hey, I'm notified that my trailer was found about... 10 miles from my home, I raced down there as soon as I could get there. And when I get on the scene, detectives are already there checking out the trailer, looking in the area, looking for my son, looking for evidence as to why the trailer was there, who put it there, where could my son be? So it appears to me that they are already taking this very seriously enough to send detectives to the scene of the trailer. But I'm guessing that everything's going to get ramped up real quickly with the finding of this trailer. If I was a detective on the scene, once I find that trailer and no vehicle, to me, this is pointing to the worst case scenario of homicide. Plus, they're going to try to find anybody that may have seen the trailer arriving and being dropped off, left there, or vehicles coming and going from the area. So you're going to canvas the area by reaching out to anybody that you think may have seen or heard anything in the week that had passed since this man went missing and now we have the trailer being found. So they find a local jogger who tells them that she had actually seen the trailer at that same location where it was eventually found. But the first time she had seen it was on Thursday, a week earlier. In fact, Thursday was the day that Austin vanished. So he goes missing on that day. And according to this jogger, that trailer was there the entire time. Right. The whole week that everybody's looking for him. So it just been sitting there. Dana, his father, says that the detectives searched the area there. There are 30 cabins in that location because I guess in that same spot, there is a summer camp. So the detectives and law enforcement went into every cabin. They even brought in dogs to help search the area. They covered a wide area during their search, but unfortunately, there was no sign of of Austin. But it's hard to imagine what his family's gone through when they start searching this land and searching the cabins. Again, everything starts pointing to something very tragic happening. Well, and this is quite interesting too here, Captain. If It gives us some insight into their investigation because the police will come out and say, hey, we need the public's help. And that's because according to a Vermont State Troopers news release, the police believe that the scrap metal found on the trailer was likely collected in Royalton, Sharon, and or the surrounding towns. So they have reason to believe that they can narrow down where the scrap metal likely came from. So they are seeking public assistance in identifying the exact locations where the scrap metal was collected from. So often, I'm sure some of us have experienced this. I know I have where you may see a hauler, a scrapper, whatever you call them in your area, but they may drop by and say to you, hey, if you ever have anything, set it out on this day or leave it out on this day and I'll swing by and pick it up. I, I do my rounds in this area on this day and I collect everything that I can. So they're looking to find people that either had a direct conversation with Austin about picking things up or set some things out that were later gone. And this would be interesting because what they want to do here, Captain, they want to try to trace the origins of the metal, and that's going to help them reconstruct Austin's day, creating a timeline and a roadmap, so to speak, and perhaps 
lead them to their missing person, Austin Colson. Authorities also determined that Austin's phone, unfortunately, was not going to be helpful to them at all. Or if it was going to be helpful, it was going to be in the least bit helpful because they figured out that it was powered off around 11.15 a.m. on January 11th, the same day that he went missing. Austin's whereabouts after that, of course, were a mystery. But when you hear about Austin, and when I first was researching this case, this young man picking up scrap metal, he has a painting service, he is making candles and, and making soaps and, and doing all these odd jobs to make it by. Go look up what Austin Colson looks like. He looks like a child, but he was doing these manly type jobs. I think by seeing a picture of him, you're going to be able to get a better sense of why his family was so fearful and maybe also why law enforcement was taking this so serious. So now we get into the searches and the searching for Austin and searching for evidence as to what could have happened to this young man. So first we know that police took a look at the small home where Austin and Katie lived together. It's not clear whether Katie gave permission for this because she may not want the police in there, not because she had anything to do with Austin's disappearance, but rather that police search the home and find a small marijuana growing operation inside the home, as well as sizable quantities of cash. That's their words, sizable quantities of cash. I do not know exactly what that means, but that is the words used in media reports. Other searches, and this is very interesting here, Captain, police conducted several searches for Austin over the next few weeks after finding the trailer. They concentrated on the area surrounding the location where the trailer was found, but to no avail. But then on February 1st, they received a tip about a, quote, body sighting. This was at a very specific two-acre property located at 714 Beaver Meadow Road. This is about eight miles from the location where the trailer was found. It's unclear what or who the source of this tip was, but police followed up on it right away. On the property... They found a baseball hat with the words A and C painting on it. This was Austin's hat. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save 50%. You can start your day off right. When you find a professional on Angie to get your plumbing right first. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Visit Angie.com. You can do this when you Angie that. All right. 
right, we are back. If you need more TCG in your earballs, check out our bonus show called Off the Record. Or go purchase one of our three bonus episodes. Colonel, cheers to you. Cheers. Well, along with Austin's hat here, Captain, according to the VT Digger, which is a great news source for this case and some others that we've covered in the past, police also located shell casings at the scene, as well as a cigarette butt with Colson's DNA on it and a pair of gloves. Mm-hmm. Now, they did not find any further signs of Austin Colson in that area, but you have to wonder, unfortunately, for the family and for his girlfriend, if I'm there on the scene or I'm a family member, I'm getting worried at this point that we might be looking for human remains rather than finding Austin alive and well. State police records show that the investigation into his disappearance began on January 12th. Troopers first interviewed the family and trying to get a sense of who Austin was, his connections, his last movements, and so on. Now, Dana and Katie both told police that Austin had plans on that day he went missing to go scrapping with Richard Whitcomb. They're giving them that name, a name. Once Austin went missing, his mother asked Whitcomb about it. He tells her that Austin had never responded to a text from him that day, and he didn't know what had happened. So now we have multiple family members saying that Austin planned to spend the day scrapping with Rich Whitcomb, and someone helped Austin tow away the trailer that he would have needed to go scrapping. But Whitcomb, as we know, says, nope, I wasn't there. It was time for police to figure out if this man is lying or not. And really, this is not rocket science here. The last person believed to be with Austin was Richard Whitcomb. Of course, police are going to be very eager to pin him down. On January 16th, 2018, Vermont State Police Major Crimes Unit Detectives Albright and Holden interviewed Rich Whitcomb at the Royalton VSP barracks. During the interview, Whitcomb denied knowing anything about Colson's disappearance. The detectives were aware that Whitcomb was a felon with a reputation for being involved in the drug trade. At this interview, Whitcomb admitted to knowing Austin and scrapping with him on occasion. But Whitcomb told the detectives that on January 11th, he never saw Austin that day. Instead, he Whitcomb was in Manchester buying cocaine. Well, that's quite the alibi. Give me a little bit of that nose sugar. Whitcomb admitted to middling drug deals for Austin Colson and said that the previous week he gave Austin a firearm as collateral in a cocaine transaction. All right. So we have Whitcomb, an ex-felon, admitting that he was the middleman in drug deals whereby he would deliver drugs to Austin's customers and bring the money back to Austin. And he had used a gun as collateral. Collateral sounds like to me, Captain, that Austin did not really trust Whitcomb with the merchandise or the money. I don't know if he should trust a drug-dealing drug user. Whitcomb admitted that he and Austin were in contact via phone on the morning of the 11th. He said that he texted Austin that morning, but Austin never got back to him. Again, that's the same story that he told family members. So the detectives naturally said, well, cool. Can we see your phone? Remember this interview is on the 16th. Austin is only missing five days at this point in our timeline. If Whitcomb is telling the truth, well, then there is every reason to believe that Whitcomb's phone would reflect that conversation. Oh, but Whitcomb told them he didn't have the phone. It was gone. In fact, he had switched to a new cellular account on the 13th telling detectives his wife found out that he made a trip to Manchester on the 11th to buy drugs. She was upset. She made him get rid of all of his drug connections that were saved on his phone. She forced him to get rid of the phone. So Detective Albright, of course, this ain't his first rodeo. He found this story to be extremely fishy. He also knew that as a convicted felon, Whitcomb was prohibited from being in possession of a firearm. Yet he just readily admitted that to the police. Whitcomb told the detectives he did get the gun back from Austin and it was located at his home, that it was still there in his house. 
but it didn't belong to him. It belonged to his father-in-law. Detectives said, well, you don't mind if we take a look for it at your house, do you? To which Whitcrum to which Whitcomb agreed to tell them where the gun was and let them enter his home to retrieve it. So he said that they could also search his car. So meanwhile, what we have here, Captain, a separate batch of detectives was interviewing his wife, Sarah, in another room at the same time. Right. They're asking her about the gun and the phone. She told them that both were at the house. She consented to a search of the residence and the couple's car. She's saying that the phone, his phone is still at their home, to which he said that they had gotten rid of the phone. So now we got some different stories going on here. But at the end of it, what we learn is that police have permission to search for the gun and the phone in their home and in their vehicles. What happens is the Vermont State Police, they're concerned that before they can get out there to search the home, that somebody else might get there and remove these items. Mm -hmm. So very smartly here, they contact some uh, police department in Hartford and asked if they would secure the Whitcomb residence so that nobody could go in and out before they could get in there and search for these items. That's pretty freaking smart. What ends up happening is a Hartford officer got to the Whitcomb's home and he convinced one of the children to open the door He called Sarah, Rich Whitcomb's wife, on the phone and had her talk him through finding the phone in the home. It was located underneath the covers of a bed in the master bedroom. The officer picked it up and placed it right next to the front door so when the detectives arrived, it was sitting there waiting for them. When the VSP detectives arrived at the Whitcomb household, During the search of the residence, the officers also located the firearm in question and then additional cell phones. They took all the phones and the gun along with an eight-round magazine containing five bullets and left the premises. But they would be back, Captain, because on February 9th, they charged Richard Whitcomb with federal charges of possession of a firearm as a previously convicted felon and the use of a firearm in a drug transaction. But they still didn't have enough to charge Whitcomb with anything related to Austin Coulson's disappearance. But they named Whitcomb publicly as the only person of interest in the case. And that's because of what they found or did not find on his phone. Let's go through the wording of these search warrants for Whitcomb. Yeah, the wording here is key, and it goes along with the idea that he's the only person of interest in Austin's disappearance. The warrants say that searching Whitcomb's property was necessary because police had, quote, probable cause to believe that such property or objects will be found and will constitute either possession or sale of cocaine, unlawful restraint or kidnapping, carrying a dangerous weapon while committing a felony or aggravated assault, manslaughter, or homicide. Wowza. Yeah, that really seems to echo what their thoughts and beliefs were in this case. Meanwhile, they started with the phone that Whitcomb said that he had gotten rid of, but of course they found it in his home. When investigators got the phone in front of their techs, they noticed that the phone appeared to have been wiped clean, but of course they were able to retrieve and view some of Whitcomb's communications anyway. Immediately after Austin went missing, this is what Whitcomb is searching for. His his internet searches on his phone are at the same time that Austin Colson goes missing. One search was for how long does gunpowder residue or GSR last? And also whether deleted text messages can be retrieved. Yes, dumbass, they can. (laughs) On January 15th, he had a text exchange with his wife, Sarah, that included the following. Sarah, text, tell me the truth, Rich. It's all going to come out. Rich Whitcomb replies, it's all crap. I'm telling you the truth. Sarah, I want to know what happened to Austin. Are you the last person to talk to him? Whitcomb, no, his girlfriend was the last. I saw him Monday. Sarah, you text him Thursday. And then he vanished. Weird stuff. Sounds like the police are not the only ones that are suspicious of Rich Whitcomb. Well, people are starting to catch him in a lie. He's telling people, I I didn't talk to him Thursday. I didn't see him Thursday. Now we're getting information that he 
the, they text him on Thursday. So then one could assume that he at some point met up with him. Yeah. The, the evidence on the phone is really all just kind of good circumstantial evidence, but it does not appear that there was much useful information on there so that they could track, uh, tracking information for the phone or anything leading them to Austin Colson. Other than the police said that it placed Whitcomb on the 11th, this is interesting, at the location where the trailer was picked up from at Dana's house. So he says, I never saw him, but his phone says that he was near Dana's house around the time that the trailer was removed from Dana's property. You lying shit, princess. The other thing, too, is his phone also places him in the area where the trailer was eventually found. But it's also difficult, too, because if they have worked together, you're going to find his fingerprints or Austin's fingerprints in his car. You're going to find, you know, some DNA, touch DNA of Austin and Rich's vehicle and Rich's DNA and Austin's vehicle. So that that does make things a little bit more complicated. So you have to really gather up as much circumstantial evidence as you can before you can try to find um, the nail nails in the coffin of the case. And that's exactly right. You're not really looking for proof that the two knew each other or were together at any point leading up to the, the disappearance. You're really looking for your proof that they were together on the day that Austin Colson disappeared. And that will be key here. And what you have is you have evidence that is showing you that, yes, in fact, Whitcomb was likely with Austin Colson on that day, but you still have Whitcomb's alibi that, Hey, I was a hundred miles away purchasing cocaine. Well, let's dive into that alibi real quick, shall we? So Whitcomb is going to try to back this up by saying not only was he away, but there are people that could, could place him away from Dana's home and away from where Austin is believed to have last been seen. There's one person in particular, and this person that Whitcomb claims accompanied him to Manchester was a one Mark Ruppel of Lebanon. Whitcomb originally gave police a false last name. I don't know the false last name that they, that he provided to police. He said that the person's name was Mark something. I guess he was hoping that they would not be able to locate this individual, but the police were a lot smarter than Rich Whitcomb. Mark sniffing butts. So they find out that the person he was talking about was this Mark Ruppel. So they find Ruppel. They interview him. Ruppel tells police that Whitcomb called him on January 17th and was, quote, upset on the verge of crying and begging him to tell the police that he had either seen Whitcomb or was hanging out with him in Manchester on July 11th. This is quoted from police affidavits. But Ruppel hadn't been with him on the 11th. This is a direct contradiction to Whitcomb's statement that he gave to the police on January 16th. So he manufactures this alibi on the 16th. They're able to find this Mark Sniffin, whatever you called him. Sniffin butts. And his real last name is Ruppel. And thankfully, this Mark Ruppel is a better guy than Rich Whitcomb because he says, look, man, I ain't going to lie for you. And he tells the police straight up. Uh, I wasn't with him, and in fact, he called me and asked me to say that I was. Right, so as law enforcement, again, this rich guy is a giant pile of shit, and he's a liar. He he tells you I was with this guy, makes up the last name. The guy tells you, no, I wasn't with him, and he wanted me to make up an alibi. Anybody that's trying to make up an alibi always goes to my number one on the suspect list. And before we move on, Captain, I just want to echo what we said earlier, that the information, what little information that police were able to pull from that phone, that cell phone that Rich Whitcomb said didn't exist anymore, but they found it in his home, it absolutely pointed out that A, he was where the trailer would have been picked up from on the day that Austin went missing. B, he was in the area of where the trailer was later found a week later. His phone says he was there on the day that Austin Colson went missing. And so everything that they're seeing from his phone would indicate that he was lying and that he actually was with Austin Colson on the 11th when Austin went missing. Well, you got to go a step further. 
The phone says that he was with the trailer in the morning. The phone says he was with the trailer in the afternoon. And then the phone says he was in the location where Austin's hat, cigarette, and bullets were found. This brings us to May 23rd on our timeline when police conducted an all-day search for Austin at a two-acre property where they had previously found the baseball hat that belonged to Austin or that they believed belonged to Austin. I can't imagine that there were too many A and C painting baseball hats anywhere in America, let alone in this small town in Vermont. So I would think that they're pretty much 99% convinced that it's his hat at this point. It was hoped that now that it was springtime and all the snow had melted, that it might expose things that were previously hidden, things that they had missed in their previous search. This remote property was down one of those long winding dirt roads that are commonplace in Vermont. A police press release that evening stated, quote, crews located what are believed to be human remains at the Beaver Meadow Road location. The body was found buried in the dirt floor of an old dilapidated barn on the property. Three days later, on the 26th of May, the chief medical examiner's office used dental records to identify those remains as belonging to Austin Colson. So whose property was this and how did Austin get there is now our big questions. Again, from the Vermont Digger. The home on Beaver Meadow Road that sits near the large barn is owned by Carlton Family Trust, according to property records. Buck Carlton, who is listed as a broker with Northeast Commercial Realty in West Lebanon, told the Valley News he owns the home on Beaver Meadow where police had been searching. Carlton says he stays at the home from time to time. Buck Carlton was a snowbird. So he's someone that goes to warmer climates during the winter months. And he says that while he's absent, Carlton employed a caretaker to keep an eye on his property. He says that the person that he put in charge of this is this Rich Whitcomb. All of the phone evidence is saying he was with Austin Colson on the day that he disappeared. And now we have the owner of the property saying, where you found Austin Colson's body, this man, Rich Whitcomb, had access to the barn and was expected to be at the property from time to time to take care of this property while I'm gone. According to the autopsy and according to Vermont's chief deputy medical examiner, Austin died from multiple gunshot wounds to the head inflicted by another person. Oddly, though, the death certificate puts his place of death as woods or place found and the date of his death as January 2018. His death was classified as a homicide. The Windsor County State's attorney announced that the case was in a holding pattern while police worked the ballistic evidence. Meanwhile, his father, Dana, told WCAX News, we hoped for a better outcome, but it was good to get the final official word, so we're not wondering. He pointed out that Austin's phone, wallet, and car keys remain missing at that time. As far as we know, they have never been found, Captain. I've heard people criticize law enforcement a little bit because they found some items of Austin and then it took them four months to do another search. But I don't know how long they searched the initial time that they did search. And I don't know what the conditions of the weather were. So mm -hmm. what people need to realize is it's not an hour-long episode of Law & Order or an hour-long episode of Unsolved Mysteries. The hands of justice sometimes work very slowly. Well, and we're not getting told a lot of the story, which we don't need to have a lot of the story. But we should all be smart enough to go, well, they didn't just find his hat and go, okay, well, that's enough work for today. Yeah, see you guys later. See ya. See you at the bar. Got to be there by 3 p.m. <laughs> no, uh... What I like here, and when they go out on these searches, we got to keep in mind, they've not been to this area before. They could arrive on site that day and go, whoa, we got a lot of difficulties and a lot of unexpected problems here in searching this property. What I love, though, is they're going, this is a place we want to come back to. This is a place that we want to search again, and we want to keep digging and finding 
whatever we can because we think we have a case here. I'm going to shorten some of this a little bit because we have some difficulty in the case as far as getting anybody charged in relation to Austin Colson's first disappearance and then later ruled a homicide. But in the course of a lot of the things that we've already discussed, remember we have those charges that Whitcomb was facing based off of him in possession of a gun and using a gun in the transaction of drug trade. So he will actually face those charges before Austin Colson's body is even recovered. At the pretrial for those charges, we have Austin's family there that are wearing shirts that say, where's Austin? We also have his father going on record, speaking to the media, saying we have a lot of reason to believe Rich Whitcomb is very guilty and not expanding on that too much, but we know exactly what his father means. He's very guilty, not only in these charges, but these charges are really just sort of backing up all of our thoughts and beliefs that he is responsible for what happened to our son, to our family member. But it's smart for law enforcement. Get him on these charges. You have a bad individual. You have this bag of shit now locked up and charged with these. And you can then put together and piece together a case, which right now has a lot of circumstantial evidence. Well, and the prosecutor for those charges made a really good effort to try to convince the judge that, hey, this dude, Rich Whitcomb, is extremely dangerous. And it's, he's not only dangerous because of his previous crimes, the crimes we know that he committed and the crimes that we are charging him with today, but also because he is the number one suspect in a murder that we have not been able to bring charges against him yet. So you should keep him in jail for the entirety of of the time leading up to his trial for these charges. Right. Sadly, the judge did not fully agree with this. The judge let him out, but this was based on the condition that he enter a drug treatment facility and that he was allowed to go home after completion of that rehab. He was required to wear an electronic monitoring bracelet, and he had some other uh, parameters that he needed to play within during that time. Rich is going to take a plea deal on one of these charges. Yeah, they will ultimately drop one of the counts and deal on the other one. Now, again, we have an assistant U.S. attorney. Her name is Wendy Fuller. She really wanted him convicted to the, the fullest extent, right? Give him the best and longest punishment that you can because... Wendy Fuller knows how dangerous Rich Whitcomb is. If he's out, he's a danger to society and to our communities. She wanted to get some comments on the record, despite the fact that she said in court they could not charge, they could not change the sentence because there was a plea agreement determining that. But she wants to really hit home how dangerous this individual is and remind them that he is a suspect in a murder. So I'll read for you just portions of her statements during court. It says, This case started, as your honor knows, in connection with a very serious investigation, but it's largely driven by the defendant's own admissions. And so he admits to being a member of that community who regularly sold drugs. This is a community. It's small. It has struggled mightily with drug abuse, and he aided in that. I understand that he was not selling drugs for financial gain. I've never made that allegation. He was doing it to feed his own addiction, but it's serious nonetheless. And by selling drugs to other drug addicts, you keep that cycle of addiction alive. And it keeps these people who are addicted unable to contribute to their community. They cannot pay their bills. They cannot take care of their children. It destroys lives, just like it has in some sense destroyed his. But he did that to other people. So I just want to be clear that this is not merely having access to a firearm. There are greater factors here that go into the seriousness. So he's regularly selling to people in his community. But the other aspect of this case is that he decided to take a firearm that did not belong to him, that belonged to his father-in-law, he took the firearm and he used it as a currency in a drug trade. He traded it to Mr. Colson. Mr. Colson gave him drugs in exchange for that. 
so that Mr. Whitcomb could go out and sell more cocaine. This conduct is extremely serious. Drug-related offenses with firearms, as your honor knows, is on the rise in Vermont. And what comes with that are drug-related shootings and drug-related homicides. And so this conduct of taking a firearm, especially one that doesn't belong to you, and giving it to somebody in exchange for cocaine, it's some of the most serious conduct we see in drug-related crimes. And so that's why he's here. That's why he's in federal court. He committed a very serious crime. But on top of that, we have the defendant's characteristics. As I read his criminal history, he has a violent history. I don't think there's any dispute about that. In 2002, he had an unlawful mischief conviction in which he harassed his girlfriend, damaged her belongings, and then during the arrest, he had a loaded rifle. And when the police asked him if he intended to use it on himself, he said, no, I'd rather shoot you. He was convicted of that offense, and then he went on to violate his probation for that offense twice, once for harassing and assaulting yet another girlfriend. That's the 2003 felony conviction for domestic assault. And I'd like to read from the affidavit of Lieutenant Jordan with regard to the domestic assault felony conviction so the court understands the gravity of this offense. And I will substitute the victim's name for the word victim. The victim told me that they arrived at home and Whitcomb continued to scream and yell at her. This went on for some time when Whitcomb got mad at her. The victim said Whitcomb grabbed her by the arms and threw her to the floor. She was in pain. The victim said that Whitcomb then grabbed her by the hair and dragged her down to the basement. He put her in a headlock and he started choking her. She could not breathe and she began to pass out. The victim said that Whitcomb let her go and then threw her onto the floor where he punched her in the head. The victim told the lieutenant that Whitcomb was looking for bullets and his hunting knife and Whitcomb told her he was going to kill her and slit her throat. The victim said that Whitcomb could not find his hunting knife, so he again grabbed her by the hair, dragged her out of the basement and back upstairs. The victim, in fear for her life, said she broke free, ran out of the house, and called her neighbors who called 911. Now, these are not just the victim's words, Captain. Whitcomb pled guilty to that offense. And to reiterate, we have cell phone technology that puts him with the other victim, Austin, the day of, the afternoon of, the evening of, and then he's caught lying to police trying to establish an alibi, and he's caught by police lying over and over. Yes, and then ultimately what we have is Whitcomb is sentenced in January of 2020 to 37 months in federal prison. So he's 40 years old roughly at that time. He's still going to have to do his time. He was scheduled to be released in February of 2023. However, we've seen Austin's mother posting recently that Whitcomb has already been moved to a halfway house and will be released altogether in 2022. It actually looks like he may have already been released. I just could not confirm any of that information to to support the statements that she posted online. Regardless... It's to point out that he was supposed to be locked up until 2023. And I guess that what they were hoping, they being law enforcement, was that we might not be able to charge this guy yet with a homicide, but maybe we could build a case against him. And in the meantime, he's locked away in federal prison, so he's no real threat to anybody in our communities. But if these posts that Austin's mother are, are, are posting online, if they are true, then this man is already back out and walking walking around a free man. Well, I know there seems to be some frustration with law enforcement, but I'm not willing to give up on them just yet because I don't know what cards they are holding close to their vest. What it seems to be for me is that they're building a case, and again, hands of justice sometimes move very slowly. There is also some online rumor that Richard Whitcomb is responsible for possibly another homicide. And these are based off of several Facebook posts like this one. that simply say, quote, everyone knows Whitcomb was involved 
with Robbie Briggs' murder, end quote. Now, I, Captain, could not find any evidence or any articles that name Whitcomb as a possible suspect in Robbie Briggs' murder. That's a 20-year-old homicide case. And in fact, I found to the contrary of that, that there were other possible suspects that were named in some of those articles. Richard Whitcomb's name did not appear in anything that I read. Regardless, it's one of those situations where, yes, I'm on your side here, Captain. I think that law enforcement has done a pretty good job in this case, but if they are holding on to something that we've not already reviewed, if they have the icing on the cake that is going to be what they, what one would expect that you would want to have and charge this man with murder, I think now's the time to do so if, in fact, that he's out. We've seen his repeated history of violence that he carries out on people that are close to him. So anybody out there close to Richard Whitcomb, if he's out and you're hearing this, get as far away as you possibly can. Well, this is why it's important. And if you know something, you need to say something to keep the rest of the world, the rest of the community safe. It's not just all on law enforcement. We have to do our part as humans to go, hey, I actually know some information that could put this guy away. Come forward and say something. Thank you so much for joining us here in the garage. Thanks for telling a friend. Thank you so much for sharing the show on social media. Colonel, do we have any recommended reading for the beautiful people? First up, a late and overdue happy Mother's Day to everybody out there listening. This one was sent to me as a gift, and I'm very grateful to have received it because this is a great and fascinating true crime book. The title is If You Tell, A True Story of Murder, Family Secrets, and the Unbreakable Bond of Sisterhood by the great Greg Olson. He is one of the best in the biz. I recommend that you check this one out. Here's a little background information. This is the true story of three young girls caught in the web of a coldly calculating killer. After more than a decade, when sisters Nikki, Sammy, and Tori hear the word mom, it claws like an eagle's talons, triggering memories that have been their secret since childhood until now. Check out If You Tell by Greg Olson. You can find that great recommendation and many more on our recommended page at truecrimegarage.com. And until next week, be good, be kind, and don't live. The Angie's List You Know and Trust is now Angie, and we're so much more than just a list. We still connect you with top local pros and show you ratings and reviews, but now we also let you compare upfront prices on hundreds of projects and book a service instantly. We can even handle the rest of your project from start to finish. So remember, Angie's List is now Angie, and we're here to get your job done right. Get started at Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I, or download the app today.